Now it eventually. Okay. Now recording. I can the password cracking assignment. The big issue is that there are two LST files. Uh, if you're in a Windows system, you should always set it to display the file extensions. There are some serious security issues if you don't use the file extensions. So you should always have it display. Uh, there is a option to not show known file extensions, just show them. Besides, when you show them, it's easier to see what the real extension is. So if you download the common passwords.txt file, change the extension to LST. That's one of the LST files. The other one could be, have any name. It's a temporary file. I said any place slash any file dot LST. And a lot of people took that literally. I, I meant, you can put it anywhere. Put it in the directory where you're putting all your other files for this assignment. I would call it hash.lst because in fact, that's what it's going to hold. The Johnny program is a front end to the John the Ripper. And one of the things Johnny does is we'll go out to various file formats and extract the information that the Johnny the Ripper program needs. And so it extracts the key information from the zip file, puts it in the hash.lst, and then the Johnny, or then the John the Ripper will look at that file and the common passwords and find out which one matches. Okay. Uh, also remember that when you download the tools, you have to unzip them. It doesn't work very well if they're not unzipped. And all you have to do is once you find the password, and the password is below all the boxes, that you have to submit that password up on Blackboard. Okay. Any questions about the assignment? Right, good for it. A bunch of people have already done it. A lot of hundreds. I have one quick question. So when we go in there to put our password, are we just submitting the password? We're not putting anything in those other two blocks, right? Where it That's says correct. You don't have to do it. Several people are giving me screenshots. That's unnecessary. <laughs> Okay. Uh, as long as you give me the right password. I have had a few students who did the assignment. I could see from what they gave me, they had the right password, but they picked out the wrong letters. Look in the example very carefully. I put it in red. That's where the password is. It's usually to the left of uh, your file name, which would be your zip file. That's where you want to get it. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, the others. I had a quick question, Professor. Sure. Uh, when I tried it, uh, I think I got like a, a long list of, it, it just looked like a string, a huge string. I'm not sure what I did wrong. Do you think you could help me or kind of steer me in the right direction? Once you create that hash.lst file, if you happen to look in it, it has, yes, a whole bunch of hexadecimal numbers, I think. That's the hash. It's meaningless to look at. Uh, make sure that you have the two LST files. Some people have been overwriting their passwords with the other stuff, and that doesn't work at all. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Sure. Any other questions? And if you're having problems, you can email me, text me, make an appointment, and we can work together online with Zoom. You can share your screen. We'll step through it make sure you've got it. Uh, the other assignment out there is the number base convert from binary hexadecimal and decimal. Remember, it's timed. It's timed. So the times shown are for students who are in the undergraduate program. They have 90 seconds. If you are in the other programs, you'll have to calculate what the score will be yourself. But remember, the program sends the percent correct and the time it took to the server where I will then extract that and calculate the scores appropriately because I know which program you're in. Any other questions about either of the assignments? Do not wait till the last minute. Okay, today we're moving on with encryption. We're gonna talk a little bit about the encryption arguments, review of that stuff. We'll talk about encryption modes, how to use the encryption systems, and we'll talk about hash systems. Okay. 
Basically, cryptography is where you take plain text. And again, plain text is the name we call the original information. And it can be text. It can be a program. It could be a doc. It could be, it could be an image, anything. Bits or bits. It doesn't matter. And then you're going to run that through an encryption program with the appropriate key. And out comes ciphertext. And ciphertext can either be stored or it can be sent across the network where you run through a decryption program with the appropriate key. And out should come the plain text, which should, if everything works right, be exactly the same as the text it started with. In the middle, that ciphertext should look like garbage, like nothing. Nobody should be able to figure out what it means without the appropriate key. I went out looking around, and I found out that a lot of people, at least 2007, which is, gee, that's six years ago. That's a while ago. That's 71% of the companies used encryption for their we're sending data around. I bet these numbers are much higher now. People are more concerned about security than ever. So a lot of people use encryption. Uh, crypto shredding, didn't talk about that before. Crypto shredding is a way to quickly delete information. Say you've got a lot of information, particularly like on a slow device. For, for instance, a USB drive, and you want to get rid of it. You want to make sure nobody reads it. Well, if it had been encrypted to start with, then all you have to do is wipe out the password. Assuming you used a good password and it's not easily cracked by John the Ripper or any tool like that, but if you used a good strong password, then if you delete the password, then the only thing out on the thumb drive is these random bits and you can consider it erased because uh, it can't be read. Of course, with USB and, and uh, solid state disks do eventually have to erase the data because erasing it actually clears it. But that's that's a subject for another class. Okay. Uh, might note that Apple Apple uses crypto shredding. Uh, when you say erase everything, it doesn't actually go out and overwrite the information. It just writes over the key, and then the information is worthless. While it is not important to know the details of any of these encryption algorithms, you should have the general concepts of how this works. The AES and DES algorithms are substitution permutation algorithms. They have a series of stages where each time the exclusive or the data with the key, run it through these S boxes, which just do a substitution, and then rearrange the bits. Uh, this is. Here we show the, all these wires. That just means that this bit's going to go over there, that bit's going to go over here, and we're diffusing the information. Remember, there's diffusion and confusion. We're taking bits and spreading them across the whole chunk that's being encrypted. Those S boxes are just substitutions. They perform a fixed substitution for a certain bit pattern coming in. They have a different bit pattern going out. Typically, by the way, the bit pattern is not the same going in and out. And in fact, it's not the inverse going in and out. People, DES algorithm used S boxes. And after decades of research, people have learned something about what makes a good S box and a bad S box. And when they went around and made the AES algorithm, they knew those things. And again, the permutation just moves bits around. Sometimes they expand the number of uh, bits and sometimes they compress them. We mentioned that DES, the Data encryption standard was very well. It was very commonly used for a long time. It turned out not to be very secure. Uh, the key is too short. It's got a 56-bit key, and nowadays your laptop can brute force that to find out what the key was. So several years ago, people started using triple DES. Triple DES is you encrypt it three times. You take your plain text and you encrypt it with one key, then you decrypt it with another key. Well, since it's a different key, it doesn't turn it back to the plain text, it scrambles it up even more, and then you encrypt it a third time using a third key. Now you can use three different keys, or key one and key three can be the same. Still, this turns out not to be very good, and all applications should stop using triple DES at this time. The algorithm that everybody is using for symmetric encryption is AES. So far, nobody seems to have a way to break that, at least the NSA has a way, they're not telling us. It takes 128 bit blocks and can use three different key modes. The keys that are either 128 bits and it goes through, I think, 10 stages, 
or 194 bits and goes through 12, or 256 bits and goes through 14 stages. So each stage can be done by an instruction on your Intel processor or your ARM processor or your AMD processor. Most of your modern processors now have an instruction that does that Intel, uh, or excuse me, AES stage, which makes it, of course, much faster. Having written programs to do this type of encryption, the weirdest thing is trying to read, shuffle the bits. There's kind of experiment and programming. Okay. Asymmetric or public key encryption uses two different keys. You have to have two separate keys. You take one key, and we'll talk about probably on Wednesday. How do you get that public key? But you get that public key, if, I, if you want to send a message to somebody you know anybody else to see it, you take the public key. Bob, Alice is going to send a message to Bob. He gets Bob's public key, encrypts the data, Bob's public key, sends across the network. Anybody might be able to see that. They can... They know Bob's public key, but because they don't have Bob's private key, they can't decrypt it. So Bob can decrypt it and get back to where it was. Now, RSA encryption uses this uh, system where you raise the message. And of course, the message is just a bunch of bits. Think of those bunch of bits they, as an integer. Of course, they could be text, they could be an image, whatever. But they're bits. You can think of them as a number. So you, Raise that number to the power E mod N. And that's the ciphertext, and you can save that or send it. And then to put it back, you raise C, that ciphertext, to the power D mod N, and you're back with the message. Easy enough. The letters E and N are the encryption key, and D and N are the decryption key. Here's how you make them. Again, you don't have to know the details, but you have an idea how this works. Again, you get two big primes, multiply them together, and that's your n. And then if you know those big primes, you subtract one, multiply them together, that's your toitin of n. Uh, then you got to choose e, which has no common multipliers between e and the toitin. Uh, pick d such that uh, it's the inverse of d, or, or d times e equals one mod toitin. There you have it, then. n and e are your public key, and n and d are your secret key. Here's an example using small numbers. Uh, this is really too small to be an effective encryption algorithm, but I can do these numbers with my calculator. The other numbers, raising a 128-bit number to a four-decimal di digit number, it takes a lot of programming, it takes a lot of calculating. My calculator doesn't do that. This, my calculator does. So let's pick two primes, three and 11. Multiply them together and your n is 33. Then you get your toilet. So three minus one is two, three minus one is 10, two times 10 is 20. Okay, choose E. Now, the E should have no common multipliers with uh, 20. Uh, seven is a prime number, so there's, there's no other factors. Uh, it doesn't multiply into 20, so bingo. No common multipliers. Then we want the inverse of that. The inverse, of course, is a number that you can multiply times that. So uh, three is the is the one, because three times seven, and there's 21, mod 20 gives you one. The inverse of a number, you know, is what gives you one. If you do base 10 usual stuff you learned in high school, the inverse of five is one fifth, or 0.2. Well, in rings, modular arithmetic, they're all integers. It's the one that will wrap around enough times to come back to one. Okay. So we, have, so we have three. So E is seven, D is three, N is 33. All right, pick a message five and raise five to seven, which is the E mod 33, and you get the number 14. When you try it in your calculator, it works. By the way, if you do it in your calculator, you get a number and a fraction. Subtract the whole part of the number, get the fraction, multiply it by 33, and you should get 14. Well, my calculator got 13.9999, which it's round off error to 14. Okay, so that works. You take that 14, you cube it, which is, of course, raising to the power D mod 33, and you get five. Voila, it actually works. You can try this. Those are the numbers you like. Of course, you usually use very large values of P and Q uh, because you don't want it to be easy to factor. 
when you use large numbers, it's difficult to factor. Of course, m has to be less than n because it's going to be mod n, so all the numbers are less than n. The text is going to be log base 2 of n number of bits. So that's it. OK. Key strength, the bigger the key, the more uh, secure it is. Because the bigger the key, the harder it is to brute force. You can imagine brute forcing if you only had three bit keys. Three bit keys, two to the three is eight. Something you should know for the power of two. But two to the three is eight. You only have to try eight possible combinations. With, with a computer, you can do in milliseconds. And then you'll know what the proper answer is. So you want to use really big numbers. So there's many, many possible combinations. And it will take more than your lifetime to figure out. Asymmetric, or AES, you can use almost any random bunch of bits to be the key. We talked about how to compute the keys for RSA. So that takes some calculations. You cannot use any bunch of bits. OK, have a question here. Yes, our first question. So let's try this. We will run the poll. Launch that. Oh. Does anybody need a clicker card? Got your cards? Oh, beans. All right, cards up. Get figured out. Not that hard. I got two cards. Oh, okay. That's good. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. This obviously is using the previous example. But the folks online, they have it. And the folks here in class, pretty good. The answer is 32. One less than n is the maximum number for the value that you can send. So the answer is 32. Questions about that? Try to go with that. All right. Moving on. Uh, Oh, okay. hybrid encryption. As you mentioned before, AES is much, much faster than RSA. Yes, we have a question? You had a question. Oh, backing up to ask the question, where did DE and... Uh, here in this example, we've got E and D to encrypt. We raise the message to the power E mod N. And to decrypt, we take the message, or in this case, the ciphertext, raise it to the power D mod N. So seven is important. It's the public key that everybody knows, along with N. Nobody should know E. Uh, sorry, D. This is D, the three. And everybody knows N. Does that make sense? It's back up here. Yes. And there again, to encrypt, it's the message raised to E mod N and decrypt that way. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, when you create a password, you create the E and the N and the D. So, back up. All right. And we just answered that. That's where N again is the mod. So, when less than 33 is 32, that's the answer. Hybrid encryption. As I mentioned, AES is fast, RSA is slow doing all the raising numbers to a power mod n is computationally complex. AES, again, they have hardware that does it. It's really quick. I looked out and your laptop should be able to do giga, a billion a second, uh, real fast, uh, billions of bytes a second. So that's pretty good encryption rate. 
they set up a 15, depending on you know how much you paid for the chip in your laptop, but it should be able fast. You were talking really fast. RSA is not nearly so fast. There's no hardware assist, and it follows a lot of fancy arithmetic. So sometimes we use hybrid. Here at hybrid, we make up an AES key. They just make up some random numbers. Soon Alice over here on the left wants to talk to Bob over here on the right. And Bob has a public key. Alice gets Bob's public key, makes up a 128-bit or 256-bit, whatever you like, uh, AES key, encrypts that key. So they're only encrypting 256 bits, which is, what is that, 32 bytes or something? It's not a lot. Crypts that, ships that across to Bob. Bob decrypts it with the private key that he knows, and only, hopefully only he knows, and he gets the AES key. Now, Alice and Bob share an AES key. They have the same values. Nobody could have gotten it in the middle because if Eve was watching everything that goes across between Alice and Bob, Eve could have seen the encrypted value, but she doesn't know how to decrypt it. She doesn't have Bob's private key. So after that, everything they send across the network, they use the AES encryption instead of the RSA. You only use the RSA right in the beginning to send the key across. After you sent the key across, both sides have an AES key. You use that for all the rest of it. It's much, much faster. And yet that way you can share keys. There are other ways to share keys, but this is one of the most popular ways it's done. This is used in secure socket layer or transport layer sockets. Uh, SSL has been out there for a long time. It's been that good. Now people are using TLS. It's the S. When you see HTTPS is in secure, when you have HTTPS, it's encrypting everything that goes across the network. Whereas you go just HTTP, it doesn't use any encryption at all. Another feature of HTTPS it uses certificates, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, but it helps you identify who that uh, server is. Is this really the server you thought you're going to? So if you're going to www.acme.com, when you get to the other side, does it have an acme.com certificate? If it does, you can feel pretty secure that it's people you're using, you want to connect with. If the certificate says something else, then you probably should not accept it. Okay, that's encryption. Uh, encryption back doors appear every now and again. Uh, not too much anymore because when they last tried to do it, it raised such a stink that people gave it up. But the concept of a back door encryption is that there's another way to encrypt. You have the key, but there's a secret super key that somebody might have to decrypt things. Now this can be used, for instance, in a business application where the boss has the super key. And even though you may encrypt things, if you say get fired, killed, you leave, the boss may want to still be able to decrypt things even though they don't have your key, they'll use the super key. Sometimes governments like to be able to decrypt things. Two ways to do it is super key or something called a key escrow, where there is a super key or somebody has a database of all the keys and they'll look up if they have the authority. Here's another question about that hybrid encryption. Let's try that poll. All right. Let's give it a shot. Oh, okay. Target, you can see it. Thank you. Oh, okay. oh. nobody knows. I oh. want to change my answer to A. Go, go right ahead. <laughs> 
but that would be a mistake because the answer is B. Oh, I had it right the first time. Okay, never mind. No, 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 don't change it. You had it right. Okay, we use asymmetric. Asymmetric again is a public key algorithm. RSA is an asymmetric algorithm. The keys are not the same. Symmetric, the keys are the same. So you got that symmetric, same key like AES. Asymmetric, the keys are not the same. In hybrid encryption, we typically use usually RSA, some asymmetric key algorithm to share symmetric keys. The answer is B. Uh, oh, sorry. And that's where we went. Okay, did a good job. There were some some people kept changing their key to the changing their answer the wrong way, but <laughs> that's okay. All right. Uh, moving along. Key escrow. Again, you might want to be able to get the keys. So you might have people put keys in a database and have that database encrypted, and the boss can get that database if they need to. The governments sometimes want to do this. Your friendly government sometimes wants to be able to decrypt things because you know, who knows, bad guys might be using encryption. That has been a problem. We'll get to that in just a minute. But sometimes attackers, terrorists use encryption to communicate with people and the government doesn't like that. On the other hand, people need the ability to encrypt things. If you are buying things on Amazon, from your local uh, Starbucks, you want the data going over the network to be encrypted. So you don't want your government looking at what you're buying on Amazon. Not that it makes a difference to me. Okay, a while ago, back in 1993, which I know is probably before most of you were born, but I was there, the government proposed the skipjack algorithm using the clipper chip. The idea was that you were gonna be able to have skipjack phones or phones that use the clipper chip that would encrypt the voice and you could send information across the phone. So the phone would be secure. So you could use the phone, talk everything going across the phone. So nobody could tap your line. They couldn't tell if they tapped it, they couldn't decrypt what it was. The other side would have to have the right key. But the government being paranoid would be able to get the right key and decrypt this. This was not very popular with people. Particularly the algorithm was classified and we're only gonna tell you how it worked. Um, yeah, there was a lot of pushback on it. The whole idea was they were gonna divide the key into pieces and give one piece to one agency and another piece to another agency. You might think you give one piece to the Supreme Court and another piece to the Department of Agriculture or something. And only if they both thought there was a proper judicial requirement that they have the keys and they give the half the keys they put together and they make it work. People were not convinced that this was going to happen. Uh, so it didn't happen. Nobody wanted to do this. Nobody was gonna get skipjack phones. Nobody wanted the government listening in on the conversations. Move forward to December, 2015, which is was that, eight years ago, there were, some terrorists in California and they shot a bunch of people. They killed 14 people and they got their phones. Well, the, the police killed the attackers. They had an Apple phone and they believed that the phone had been used to call other terrorists. The FBI wanted to look in the Apple phone, but they didn't know the Apple phone's password. Now, if you have an Apple phone, you can try the password 10 times. If After that, if you've made 10 mistakes, it will erase everything in the phone. So you don't get a chance to try 11 times. So the FBI wanted to try, but they didn't know how to do it. They didn't know the password. They knew if they tried more than 10 times, they would erase the data and they'd never get it. So they asked Apple to unlock it for them. Apple said, no, we're not going to do this. This did not go over well with the FBI and Apple and the FBI bumped heads. Apple was telling their customers that they were going to keep their data secure, that they were not going to give it to the FBI. So all their customers would be happy, particularly customers who are not in the United States. FBI got upset. So as it ended, Apple did not give them the ability. A third party figured it out. Third party knew how to do this. And they told the FBI. The FBI went away, sort of been able to look in that phone, but didn't know how to do it in general. 
Uh, Apple was happy and the FBI was not as happy. Uh, the lawmakers were watching all this going on and they did not back up the FBI. They put out a law saying that the government cannot enforce companies to give up encryption. So if you encrypt something, the government cannot enforce the manufacturers to give that up. I don't really know how that law is going on, but you can find out. I mentioned there were two parts to the key. How do you put those two parts together? Now I have to admit some real stupidity on my part. I had the slides together this morning, put them out on Blackboard around noon, keeping my promise to get them around noon. But I forgot to put the questions on polls for Zoom. So I cannot put a Zoom poll for the rest of them. The other two polls I put together in five minutes before class. So I apologize. Just look at this. See if you know the answer. You're not going to be able to pull for it. I'm sorry. Oh, you know what we could do? Let's just try this. Oh. Okay. Uh. What the blazes? Okay. Can you people online? Can you see the? It says message size. Can anybody see that message size question? No. Uh, no. No. Uh, I see okay. how to combine keys. Uh, no, there's another one I was trying to get. One more time. There. Now can you see the message size poll? Yes. Okay. Ignore the message size poll, look on the screen, you have A, B, C, and D, exclusive ors, A, concatenate the heads, the others, B, C is all of the above, D is none of the above. So ignoring the poll question, answer the appropriate letter. Oh, yes, okay. Let's try it here. Oh, all right. Well, it's not working as well online. On online, a lot of people like the answer B concatenate the halves together. That works. So does exclusive ordering the halves together. That also works. So both of them work. Since both of them work, the answer is C, all of the above. See if you had 128-bit key, and one agency has 128-bit key, the other agency has 128-bit key, exclusive order them together to get the real key. Or you can give them each 64 bits, put them together. Either way works. Make you think about it. Okay, enough of that garbage. This is not working nearly as well as I would like. So let's just get rid of that and move on. So, encryption. We have symmetric key, which is usually AES. If you're going to use symmetric key, everybody has to have a copy of the key. So, I'm going to send a message to you. I have to have a copy of the key. You have to have a copy of the same key. You have to keep the key secret, or, or it's pointless. Uh, it's fast. AES encryption is very fast. Again, some things said they could get billions of bytes encrypted with AES every second. It works very well if two people want to communicate. Alice wants to send a message to Bob. It works great. If you want to send a message to a group of people, that doesn't work as well because if I send a message to the whole class, then anybody in the class can read it, which might be okay, but anybody in the class can send a message to the whole class. That might work if you want, but it may not be the situation you like. Also, it works very well if you want to send a message to yourself, that is, Encrypt something, store it away, and then later bring it back, decrypt it. So you have a zip file that is encrypted and you want to read it later on. You'd want to use 
AES encryption. Asymmetric, often known as public key encryption, or RSA is the most popular version. Well, everybody knows the public key. That would be the E and the N. And only the owner of the key, the one who created the key, knows the secret key, which would be the D and the N. Of course, you have to keep this private key private. It's kind of pointless. It's slow. It's not nearly as fast as AES. It works very well if you want to send uh, a message to everybody. I could use my public key, encrypt the message. Excuse me, let me try that again. I could use my private key, send the message to everybody, and everybody could decrypt it using my public key. That proves it came from me because only I had the key. Or if you want to send a message, if everybody in the class wants to send a message to me, then they can use the public key, only I can decrypt it. it. It's because it's slow, it doesn't work real well for sending something to yourself. And if you have a group of people sending messages to each other, it becomes clumsy. Now, the RSA algorithm is secure because it's difficult to factor N. If someone could factor N, N being the product of two large primes, if they could factor that, then they'd know P and Q. Then they could subtract one from that number, get to it, and figure out the rest of it. But mathematically, it's relatively hard to factor a large number. Now, it's not all that difficult, except unless the number gets very, very big. And the numbers are very, very big. They're 4,000 bits long. That's a big number. So it becomes quite difficult to factor a large number. If the number wasn't very large, it was not. It's not NP complete. You'll see some people tell you it's NP complete. It's not. It's easier than that. It's, well, we won't go into it. But it's, it's difficult, but not NP complete. Now, quantum computing says they can fix them. They can attack RSA. AES is thought to be uh, strong enough that even if you have a quantum computer, it is not supposed to be able to break it. But in theory, a quantum computer could do that factoring and factor the N and thereby break RSA. I don't care because I don't believe in quantum computers. I've been in this business for a long time. Ain't never seen a quantum computer, neither of you. And I don't think you ever will. I have documentation that says we will not see them in the foreseeable future, which I perceive to be in my lifetime, maybe even your lifetime. People have been working on this stuff for a long time and they don't have them. They always get close. We have people in this university, we have people in the computer science department working on quantum computers. And this has kept faculty members employed for a long time. I'll tell you, people have written grants to write algorithms that could be written or should be run on a quantum computer and I analyze how good the quantum computers might be. Of course, they don't have quantum computers to run it on because they can simulate quantum computers, but they can't run on quantum computers, they don't have them. Some people have made quantum computing devices with up to maybe eight qubits. Ooh, this little laptop right in front of me has 32 billion bits. No, 32 billion bytes. Multiply that times eight, you've got 256 billion bits. Your quantum computer has eight. All right, so I don't really believe it's gonna be a problem. I don't think we're ever gonna have Quantum computer. You may disagree. This is my opinion, but I. But well, I'm happy to have all these faculty members write grants and get money from somebody. But I think the money's going to dry up after a while. People realize this thing is not going to happen. Okay. Well, here's another question. I'm going to again do the poll with the messages. And there, ignore the message size answer 719. Ignore that. Look over instead at RSA, AES, DES, all of the above are equally effective.
Oh, kind of a tie, 2233. Three. That's about the same online. So even only a third of the people online have woken up and done this. Oh, no, oh, oh, we got more of them They're coming in. We're going to stop this. Let it go. Okay. I have to keep... Yes. Okay. All the students want to send data to me. I don't want anybody else to see what they're sending to me. Then we should use RSA. I have a public key. Everybody can use my public key to encrypt the data, send it to me. Since it's encrypted, only I can decrypt it with my private side of the key. Anybody can decrypt or excuse me, encrypt it with the public key. You can't see what somebody else said because you have to have the private key to decrypt it. So the answer is A, RSA. Question, yes, sir. That's correct. The question was, if you have a, a RSA algorithm or a asymmetric algorithm, one person has that private key and everybody has the public key. Yes. So only one person can decrypt. Okay, moving on then. All right, once you have an encryption algorithm, you gotta use it correctly. There are multiple ways to use it. The, yes, we have a question. Oh, another question. Thank you for pointing. RSA is the names of the three people who created the algorithm. Rivest, Shamir, and A. Rivest, by the way, is the guy who wrote the uh, algorithms book he used in Comp 755. Yeah, so he gets around. You'll see him again. This guy does a lot of stuff. He's, his name will appear once again. Tough guy. I don't know who he is, but he knows his stuff, obviously. It's an R for others. Okay. So blocks, yeah, these things are in blocks. AES uses 128-bit blocks, DES, smaller blocks. RSA use big block because we have the mod N, which is a big number, usually key size mod. So all for a 2K key, it's about 255 bits. Okay. Standard way to encrypt, known as the electronic code book mode. You take the each block, and then here we show three blocks, but this is like the first block of the file, the second block, each one 100, and 28 bits long, run it through the cipher with the appropriate key and you come out with ciphertext, easy enough. And that works, every block is encrypted. The thing to remember is that if you have identical blocks of plain text, they will encrypt to identical ciphertext blocks. So if the block was all one bits, Whatever the junk that comes out when you cipher it, it's going to be the same as any other block that was all one bits. Here's interesting. Here's an image using BMP, and you encrypt it with uh, ECB, which is the electronic code book, electronic code book method ECB. You can see the picture of the penguin in there. Even though it's encrypted, you can still get some information out of that. Yes. Excuse me. Yes, yes. So the each imagine there's a byte for each, actually several bytes for each pixel. Usually, three or four bytes for pixel, a word. And so as you encrypt those words, if, if the white encrypts to white, you know whatever pattern that was is going to be the same pattern as it's in ciphertext. So you can see all the background looks the same. The black in the penguin looks one pattern. The white of the penguin looks another pattern. Okay, you can see the pattern of the penguin, the Linux penguin. Okay. So, there are ways to get around that problem. There are stream ciphers or blockchain ciphers. These take the text from one encryption and exclusive or it with the next one. So it goes down the line. Here is a very common cipher blockchaining known as CBC. All of these have initials, each block of ciphertext exclusive order. So 
uh, start in the middle here. It's easier to think about it in the middle. We're somewhere uh, encrypting this thing. You take the ciphertext from the previous encryption, previous block, take that exclusive or with the plain text. Already that's messing it up because you don't know what the ciphertext is going to be. Encrypt that mess with the key, and then you have more ciphertext, which then goes to the next block where you encrypt it. You start the whole thing with initialization vector, which we'll get to in just a minute. So any change anywhere in this changes all the ciphertext. So even if this block is the same as that block, it doesn't matter because they're going to be different coming through. The, this block is going to change it all. So no, identical blocks of plain text will encrypt to different ciphertext. So you no longer have that problem where you can see the pattern. That's cipher block chaining. It is a stream cipher. There's many ways. We'll talk about some others. You decrypt it. Just another way to decrypt again. You take the previous ciphertext and you take the ciphertext, decrypt it, exclusive or with the previous block, and there's a plain text. On and on. So it's just the opposite. If you look at this, it just kind of flips it upside down, and that's what it does. Okay. Oh, this is wrong. Encryption requires only the previous block of ciphertext, so it's difficult to paralyze. You, you need this block to do it, so you have to have done that block before you can do this block. So it's difficult. Who wrote that? Let me talk about the initialization vector. Initialization vectors you saw appears uh, there to uh, start the whole process, because what is the first block going to do? The first block uses an initialization vector. It's just a bunch of random bytes that you use to start the whole process. The person who decrypts it has to have the very same initialization vector. So you, the person who's sending it will create a bunch of random bytes and attach that to the file, usually in the beginning. When they send the file across, they'll send it with the initialization vector and then all the encrypted data. The receiver takes that initialization vector and uses that to decrypt it. Now, every time you send the file, you use a different initialization vector. That way, the same data, even encrypted with a different initialization vector, will come out with different ciphertext bytes. So you can't compare one transmission to another because with a different initialization vector, it's going to look completely different. And yeah, you want to make sure you get that initialization vector correctly. Don't get it. Okay. Doesn't have to be kept secret. Uh, there's other stream systems, the cipher uh, feedback method. That's very similar. Uh, yes, that's similar. one that's very popular is the gallows counter mode, GCM. I won't make you memorize the uh, letters. Because, of course, the tests are open book, open notes, open web. You can always look this up, but you need to kind of remember that. Okay, this is nice because it is easily paralyzed. This is correct. It's easily paralyzed. Why? Because you start with initialization vector, which is the initial counter. Then you increment it by one. You take that initialization vector number, add one to it, uh, encrypt that counter, and then exclusive or it with the text, and that's your ciphertext. So... It's easy to jump ahead if you want to get the thousandth block. And you just take the initialization vector, add a thousand to it, and that's what you encrypt to exclusive all of this. So that's the GCM encryption mode. Good enough? You can see why it's easily parallelizable because you can just encryption increment incrementation, just adding one. If you need to jump ahead to some far block, you can just add that number encrypt that with the algorithm with the proper key, exclusive or and away you go. Zoom, which we are using right now, Zoom uses this for encryption. The information that is being sent from here in Graham Hall room 208 going out across the web is encrypted with GCM. And it makes up a key. It does not use the key that you see if you have a password. A lot of people use passwords as Zoom meetings. You'll see Zoom meetings, they'll send you an email. The password is the uh, Zoom ID, 
which is like a nine bit number is this and the password is that. That is absolutely worthless, provides no security at all. If somebody gets the email, they see both the Zoom ID and the password. They're like, what is it? I've never seen anybody send the password separate from the Zoom ID because in Zoom, you can press a button, send the, send the email to everybody and it makes that email up and sends it off. So it is worthless. Nevertheless, a and used to require you to use the password. It took some explaining to them say, hey, you know, it doesn't do any good. Oh yeah, the rat and the rabbit. This slide comes from previous years. Uh, I've taught several security classes over the years and some of these slides are new. Some of the slides I pick up from previous decks. I taught a class that was all online and occasionally alter egos, the rat and the rabbit would show up to say, snarky things about my lecture. Okay, you'll see them again. All right, we have a question. So let's pull this. If I can get a poll open. There we go. Uh, you should see, again, ignore the question. It's really this. And as we assume the answer is not E. Okay, now now it's got you. Oh, yeah, over there. It's in the gray. Yes, oh, I think it's got you. Oh, up there. And it's a finger, you have your finger over it, so it's very difficult to see. Okay, got you. That's all for a little set. What are we doing here? Okay. All right. Uh, D is the correct answer. A lot of people got D. Uh, some people noted that A is correct, which it is, it is a random number. Nobody thought nobody thought B, append to the data, which of course is correct. It's all of the above. So the answer is D, D all the above. And again, online, yeah, I kind of got that. It was fool you sometimes. All right, Oop, there it is. Stop sharing, you don't want to see that. Okay, moving right along. Oh, wireless systems have used different encryption systems for a while. There was the Wired Equivalent Privacy, WEP, created in 97, broken in 2001, that four years. In that four years, everybody was using it. They all built it into their hardware. And all of a sudden, no, it's worthless because they found severe flaws uh, in it. It only lasted a few years. In fact, uh, there was a course at a and one of our graduate courses in security, used to have a lab where they break the WEP. It only took a few minutes to do. It was kind of interesting. People would send things and you break the keys. Didn't take long at all. Now, why was this a problem? Because, once again, this is my opinion, but I think I'm correct, that people were concerned that little bit of machines, like laptops or other things, wouldn't have the power to do strong encryption. So they made up this simple encryption like WEP, which wasn't any good. If they thought about it, in fact, other researchers showed that surely these little bitty machines could easily do the AES encryption even before they put it into the hardware. So that was a false concept. Besides, Anytime somebody says, well, can computers do that? It might be a little slow today, but computer power increases quickly. And certainly next year's computers will be able to do it. So that's my opinion. That whole concept appears many times. You see it in work. People are concerned. Oh, the laptops won't be able to do that. Yes, they will. So at least try it. Okay, so instead of using WEP, people now use WPA. Public works? No, that's a... Uh, WPA is Wi-Fi Protected Access. Uh, that came out in 2003, shortly after WEP fell apart. Uh, it uses AES, 256-bit key mode, with GCM, again, that close counter mode stream encryption. So it's pretty secure. It uses an SHA84 hash, which we will talk about on Wednesday. 
If you see something that says Wi-Fi certified, then it's got to do this. It's required. Okay. And so, again, now Wi-Fi systems use much, much stronger encryption. I use AES. AES seems to be what everybody's using. Cryptographic hashes. Let's talk about this for a minute. For two or three minutes. A, crypto, a hash is some calculation, a function you do over all the bytes of the file. Again, you might look at the bytes of the file as text or part of an image, but think of them as numbers. Think of the bits as an integer, bytes of bytes, you just take all that energy. You can do some algorithm over the bytes and get something. And that is a hash. It's easy, it should be easy to generate, but it should be hard to go backwards. And if you make any change in the file, uh, let's look at this. A bit mathematical here. You have the text, which again is text or an image or a program or anything. You run through a function, you get the hash, which is a number. You do that, it should be very difficult that given a number, you can find text that will create that number. So if you have this answer, it's very hard to find the text. In most cases, mathematicians will not be able to prove and it's possible, but they believe it's very, very difficult. That's important because now if somebody has text and a hash, then you know that that hash can be related to you. If you recompute the hash and it matches what they sent you, then you can be assured it, it was the same when it was created the first time. But nobody can make up hashes. Let's think of the simplest hash you can think of is to add up all the numbers. It's not a good idea, but it's easy to think of. When just sum all the bytes, um, mod 256, because that's all will fit in a byte, and add them together. So here we have uh, five bytes with the numbers 12, 2, 17, 24, and 9. Add them all up and you get a hash of 64. Let's say you change one of the bytes. Now, if you recompute the hash, you add them all up and you get 53, that's not the same. So if somebody sends you a message and you receive these bytes with a hash of 64, you go, whoa, that's not right. Something has been changed along the way. Of course, somebody can fool you. Here, two of the bytes have been changed. Uh, the two was changed to a four. The 17 was changed to a 15. This one adds two, that one subtracts two. And now the sum is still 64, but the data is not the same. So adding the bytes together is not a good algorithm. Fortunately, we have some really tough algorithms to invert. There are several uh, SHA or standard hash algorithms. SHA1, it's been out there for a long time. It creates a 160-bit hash which by the way is five times 32. It calculates the hash in 32-bit integers, comes out with five 32-bit integers, 160 bits, which was pretty easy to calculate. Nobody knows how to go back, although some people have gotten better at going back to be able to reduce it, but it's still very difficult. They came out with others, SHA3, there's Blake3, there's other hash algorithms. They come up with various size hashes. And they're said to be much more efficient, paralyzable, and very, very difficult to go backwards. There's another one called MD5. Uh, they have found ways to make that not as secure as you'd like. So MD5 should not be used. And SHA1 should probably no longer be used. Why not use one of the more secure ones? They're easy to do. It's interesting to note that in the United States Cyber Command, they, if you look very closely, which is near impossible in this image, you can see numbers around the circle here. That's the MD5 hash of their mission statement. Ooh, these guys are nerds. All right. Uh, okay. So you want to prove uh, an encryption key. Say you're encrypting something and somebody types in a key. Well, humans are not very good at typing random things. They tend to type words that they remember. In fact, they tend to use common passwords, and you have a list of 7,800 some common passwords, which is part of the assignment. Part of the assignment for cracking is to show it because they use common passwords. It's very easy to find out what the password is. There are tools that would do it. That whole purpose of that assignment to show you how easy it is. Note that all the passwords 
in the list of common passwords are kind of words or characters that you can type in. Of course, there are 256 possible combinations of eight bits. You can only find 93 keys in the keyboard. So there's 164 that you can't do. Uh, if you type them in, there are bits that are rarely used. Almost none of the 93 keys produce a character whose most significant bit is a one. All those are most significant are zero. So that's half the, you know, at least one of the bits is always zero. That's not a very strong key. But if you take that key, run it through a hash algorithm, you come up with a random mess of bytes, or you can use some of those bytes for the key itself. Not that you're making the key any more secure. You're just using those bytes to for the encryption algorithm. So the encryption algorithm uses a bunch of messy bytes where all the bits are are possibly used instead of something where the bits have a very good pattern. Okay. Hashing is often used for integrity. It tells you that the message got there correctly. You can take the message, make a hash, attach the hash to it, send and encrypt the hash, send it on its way. When they get the other side, they can decrypt the hash, compute the hash themselves, compare that, and see if it works. Of course, if you don't encrypt it, somebody could go on the way, could get the message, compute the hash, change the message, compute a hash for the change message, attach it, and send it to you. Message authentication codes, or MACs, or MACs, are added to messages to assure that they have been changed and to ensure the integrity of where they came from. If they are encrypted, if you encrypt the hash, then you know it came from somebody who knows that key. So if you use the AES, then somebody has to have known the key in order to encrypt it. And again, doesn't provide confidentiality. It's just used for integrity. You can use any encryption algorithm that you like. Of course, the other side has to have the key, so you can use RSA or AES, whatever you like, because you're just encrypting it. Encrypting the hash. The hash isn't very big. What do we say? They're different sizes, 160 bits to maybe 255 bits, 512 bits. It's not very large. So even a slow encryption algorithm can encrypt that stuff. Uh, here's how it works. I have a picture. Let's look at the picture. I have the pictures. Okay. Okay. You got the message. You calculate the hash and then you encrypt that, and that's your hash. You append that to the end of the message, and there's what you're sending on. Here in the blue circle is what you're sending. It gets the other side. They separate the message and the hash. They compute the hash themselves from the message. They decrypt the hash they received, and they compare them. Are they the same? If they're the same, then you have high confidentiality. That it came from somebody who knows that key, who knows the proper key to do that. So if you're using secret keys, symmetric keys, is somebody who knows the symmetric key. So if Alice is sending a message to Bob and Alice has shared the secret key with Bob, they're using the AES encryption algorithm, then Bob can be pretty well assured the message comes from Alice and it has not been changed along the way. Others can see the message, but they cannot change it. So it provides integrity, but not confidentiality. You know, what it, you know it's secure. And many times this is important. I may want to send a message out to all the students. I don't want it to be secret. I want everybody to be able to read it. But I want you to know that it really came from me. Frequently, you want to ensure that a message comes from the authority that says created the message. And the message is supposed to be widely dispersed, so nobody cares about confidentiality, but they care about integrity. This is where message authentication codes come in very handy. There's another interesting way you can use them. Uh, chaffing and winnowing. A uh, picture here, by the way, is of a woman uh, separating the wheat from the chaff by separating the wind and stuff. And ancient, done for thousands of years. Anyway, but you can use it in cryptography. The whole idea is you send a whole bunch of messages. Some are valid, some are not. Uh -huh. So you can send messages. Some of the messages have invalid uh, max that are encrypted. But if you don't know the encryption key, you don't know 
which Macs are good and which Macs are not. So you send a message, maybe with one bit per message, and a message authentication code, and you might add a serial number just to make sure. So here's how you do. Uh, Alice, who of course is always sending messages to Bob, divides the messages one bit at a time, so one bit across, and each bit is in a packet. The packet has a serial number and a Mac, or it's a hash. The hash hashes the combination of the data bit and the serial number together. You hash that, you encrypt the hash, send it off. Some of the, then Alice also sends a bunch of meaningless packets. Randomly, sometimes she sends good data, sometimes she sends garbage. The garbage has a bit, has a serial number, has a uh, hash, but anybody looking at it, they don't know if this is good data or not because they can't check the hash. Bob can check the hash because Bob can take the packet they receive, compute the hash themselves, decrypt the hash they receive, compare them. If they're good, saves that data bit, concatenates it together to get the message. Eve or anybody watching doesn't know which packets to receive. This, by the way, also works in places that don't don't allow encryption because you're not, in theory, encrypting the data. You are only encrypting the Mac. Although some governments may not may not believe that. If they don't allow encryption, they may not be friendly to chafing winnowing. Um, but there were there were modern countries that didn't allow encryption for a long time. France didn't allow encryption until this. Millennia, they, they thought you're encrypting something, you must be doing something bad. Okay. When you store passwords in a database, it is useful to hash them because if you save the hash, then whenever you get the password, somebody enters the password trying to log in, you just take the password they entered, compute the hash of it, compare it to the hash you stored, and voila, if it matches, you got it. If it doesn't match, it's not correct. If somebody breaks into your hash file and steals it, they can't compute a password that matches that hash because it's a one-way function. Just because they know the hash values, they can't compute a value they can enter to log in that will get them the proper hash value. Okay, a question. Okay, we're going again. Oh, 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 that works. Oh, good enough. Oh, there's a tie. Don't worry, the online people have got you. Online people. Online people knew that, uh, no, it, it might encrypt the data. With, it, it doesn't encrypt the data at all. It only encrypts the hash. So, you know, A and B are wrong. It does not encrypt the Mac. In fact, it encrypts the Mac, does encrypt the data. So uh, that's wrong. But it occasionally sends random data. Yes, that is correct. We have a question or just a stretch. Yeah, we're almost at the end. Yes, almost made it to the end. Okay. Enough of this. Again, the key cracking assignment. It is due Wednesday at midnight. When the clock strikes 12, the the password must be uploaded to Blackboard. A big problem people have had are combining the two LST files. There are two, two LST files. They're separate. Don't use them together. Some people have been overwriting the pa common passwords and it just messes up. Uh, two separate. Also, I use the word anywhere slash any file dot LST. That meant make up a directory. Usually use the directory where your stuff is. Uh, a nice name for the file is hash.lst, use that. Um, put that in when you convert it. Makes, this is done by the Johnny program, which is the GUI. 
it's creating this file that it can then give to John the Ripper, so John the Ripper can use it. John the Ripper doesn't know anything about zip files, but Johnny does, and it makes up a, this temporary file that's used by John the Ripper. Okay. And again, the number based conversion is out there. You got to, hey, wow, when's that one do? That one's a long time. It's got a month or so. Oh, October 1st. Yeah, wait. That's it. Any questions? Start reading, read chapter 11, key management. We'll talk about that on Wednesday. That's enough. I apologize to online people for screwing up the polls. <laughs> no worries. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Then goodbye.